Hi there, my name is Jonathan McIntosh and in this video I would like to talk to you about issues associated with tuning, instrumental melody and elaboration in Javanese gamelan music. So the aims of this um, video are to introduce instruments in the gamelan ensemble or Javanese gamelan ensemble that play the, the melody in inverted commas and we'll understand um, why we're calling it melody in inverted commas um, as a result of this video and in relation to the accompanying readings and our discussions in the lectorial. We'll also talk about elaborating instruments, so instruments that build on the melody um, in an ensemble. And towards the end of the presentation, we'll discuss important terms uh, associated with Javanese gamelan music that we need to know um, in order to gain a deeper understanding of the music. So as discussed in um, a previous video, a gamelan ensemble is a collection of instruments that play together. Um, so it's not one instrument but the collection of instruments. There are very sounding instruments and um, to begin with, in this video, I want to talk about um, instruments that play the melody in inverted commas, and these are called sarong instruments. And you can see um, on the slide, I've highlighted these instruments with um, the red rectangle. Now, in a gamelan ensemble, a Japanese gamelan ensemble, there are three various types, or three types of various sarong. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, you'll see um, the names of these uh, instruments. So the word saron, um, uh, in English we would call it a kind of trough metallophone. So a metallophone is a kind of metal instrument that plays the melody, and trough refers to the construction of the instrument. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple of slides. So there are three types of saron usually in a Javanese gamelan ensemble. And the smallest and highest saron in terms of pitch is called the saron panarus. And then the middle saron, which is uh, an octave lower than the saron panarus, is called the saron barum. And then the lowest sounding saron, which is a large instrument um, with large Flat, uh, with large metal keys, is called the Saron de Mont, and it's an octave lower than the Saron Baron. So there are three types of Sarons, and they go in size from small to medium to large. So Panaros, Baron, de Mont. And if we look at the next slide, you can actually probably, this is taken from above, you can actually compare the sizes um, of the sarong. So from the top of the picture here, you have the sarong de Mont, and then the sarong baron, which is in the middle, and then the sarong panaros, which is the highest sounding instrument. And you can see the difference in sizes and how the smaller the instrument, the higher the pitch um, that the instrument produces. And you can also see that de Mont, the de Mont has very wide keys, where, whereas in contrast, the panaros has very Kind of small keys, and they actually curve upwards in the middle um, quite a lot, which has helped to produce the particular high sound that is being formed. This is a picture that kind of illustrates the notion of a trough metallophone. So, sarons um, have wooden cases, and underneath the metal keys, there's a kind of Space that's been hollowed out, and that's called a trough. And that's where, when you hit the metal keys with the a beater, the sound reverberates around the inside in the trough, and that's what creates the particular timbre by the, the saron. Saron instruments are struck with particular mallets. So the very small saron, the saron panaros, it struck with um, the beater on the left hand side of the slide as you're looking at it, one with the, the black horn. And we need a, a very dense 
um, mallet to strike the small keys of the saron panaros, and this is why they use um, uh, this particular animal horn. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see um, wooden mallets um, that ha have um, that are various. There are various sizes of the wooden mallets. So a slightly smaller wooden-headed mallet is used for the saron barong, but a large-headed mallet is used for the saron demo. So those are the saron instruments, and they play the melody within uh, a Japanese gamelan ensemble. But there are also other types of metallophone. Um, and in contrast to the saron instrument, these metallophones have thinner metal keys, and they produce a different sound. So let's move on to discuss these instruments. These are the other metallophones. And if we look back at our diagram of the, the Javanese gamelan ensemble, um, we can see that they're highlighted here. And there are two particular types of instruments that I'm going to talk about. The first instrument is a seven-keyed instrument called a flanton. flanton. And as you can see from the picture that the keys um, have ridges down them. And they're also kind of uh, much flatter than compared to the saron instruments. And this produces a different sound because the way that the key is constructed. But also, you see on the front of this instrument that there's a very ornate wooden palette. Um, now, behind this, um, there are uh, long plastic resonators underneath each of the keys. And in contrast to a trough resonator, where the sound from the saron goes inside the instrument and the sound kind of goes around the trough, the sound for each of the keys on a flantum, the sound goes down this tube. So it produces a slightly softer um, sound. It, and so it's not as dense or as direct as the pitch produced by a saron. So that's the flantum. And it's struck with quite a big um, mallet. So um, it's got a round head. And then around the circumference of the wooden disc, um, there's a padded material. And it's the padded material that hits off the slinton key. And because it's padded, it produced, that also helps to produce the particular sound for the slinton. Another instrument that has thin metal keys that's related to the slentum is an instrument called gender, uh, not gender, gender. Um, it's just a hard, hard G, and we emphasize the second syllable, so gender. Unlike the slentum, which has seven keys, uh, gender has 14 keys. And whereas there's only one slentum in an ensemble, Usually, um, there are two gender in a Japanese gamelan ensemble. And there's a high um, sounding gender, and that's called gender panaros. And then there's a, a middle sounding uh, gender instrument, the gender barong. So the gender barong sounds lower than the gender panaros, in much the same way as the saron barong sounds an octave lower than the saron panaros. Unlike um, the other metallophone instruments, so the saron and then the slentum, um, which are played with one mallet, the gender, the player actually holds mallets in, in two hands. And you can see um, there are two mallets on the gender barong in the picture. And Playing gender is kind of similar to playing the piano, where um, you two hands sometimes play different material. And in order to play the gender, which is a very difficult instrument, um, we'll just flip on to look at the beater in more detail. OK, so the gender mallets, they look like the slenton mallet, but they're, they're very small because you can hold them in your hand. So the, the wooden part of the gender mallet sits in here, and you kind of flick from your wrist with the, with the edge um, of the mallet like this. 
And what makes playing in there so hard is that when we play the sad on or we play the glint on, we're using the, the damping technique where we're striking one note and then we're going to hit the next note. We damp the previous note by squeezing it with our thumb and first finger. So we hit, damp, hit and damp, hit and damp, or hit, hit and damp hit and damp like that. And these are the damping, this is the damping technique that many of you are developing in the Gamelan workshops. But in a Gendel, you're using two hands because you're playing independent lines. Usually the left hand is playing the melody and the right hand, or something akin to the melody, and the right hand is playing ornamental patterns. Or they're playing a pattern and the two hands play part, different notes of the pattern. And the notes are, damped with this part, so the base of the hand, so you hit and damp, hit and damp, hit and damp. So you've actually got to move quite a lot when you play the gender, and that's what makes it so difficult. It produces a very soft sound, um, like this lenton. So moving on from metallophone instruments, we're now going to talk um, about some to remaining gong instruments within the ensemble that um, these gong instruments don't actually play a role in the structure of the music. They are very important for adding elaboration parts, uh, decorative parts to um, the sound of the song on the ensemble. And on the picture here, you can see where they're located. And these instruments are called bonang, bonang instruments, B-O-N. A -N -G, and they're small cradled gongs. And these are sets of cradled gongs that are, where the chimes are set on kind of long racks uh, and they're on um, wound cord. So let's go on to look at a picture of, of these instruments. So there are, again, um, a high sounding bonang and then a middle sounding bonang. So the bonang panorus, which is the top bonang here in the picture on the slide, and then the bonang baron, which is the lower um, bonang. And it might not be very obvious from first looking at these pictures, but if you do look quite carefully, you'll see that on the bonang baron, which is the bottom picture, the line of chime gongs that is closest to you as you view that picture, they're quite large. And you can see that the top of the gong is flatter. And then, whereas if you look at the second row of the Bonang Barong, the gongs kind of go up more like this. So instead of being flat, it's got kind of a more this shape. Okay, so that shows you that those gongs are higher in pitch. And then if we look at the top picture, the gongs in the front um, row on the first one, the first line closest to us as we look at, look at the picture, those gongs are actually the same pitch as the second row of gongs or the high gongs on the Bonang Baron. But the second row, uh, they're even in higher pitch because you can see that they are, they're actually more kind of shaped like this. Okay, so they produce a higher pitch. So the Bonang Panarus plays an octave higher than the Bonang Baron. Okay, but they share the middle octave that they play. So the Bonang Baron plays a low octave and then a middle octave. And then the Bonang Panarus plays a middle octave and a high octave. These Bonang chime gongs are struck with um, long beaters that are wound with cord at one end. And the cord part of the beater strikes the, the boss, which is the, the gold sticky out bit on top of the chime gong. So this is similar to the kanong, the ktuk, and the kumpyang. They're all different forms of chime gong or cradled gongs. But the bonang gongs don't participate in the colotomic structure of the music. They play elaborate parts, usually fast moving parts as well. So we've talked about saron, metallophone instruments, and then other metallophone instruments with thinner keys, 
the Slenton and the Gender. And we've also talked about the small trigon instruments, the Bonin. But there are also some other remaining instruments that we need to talk about. We might not use these instruments in the Javanese gamelan workshops that we're participating in, but we will be hearing these instruments in various recordings. And it's important to be able to tell you what these instruments are and that you have some understanding of the timbres or the different sounds produced by these instruments. And also, in Java, these instruments do play important roles within an ensemble. Um, so again, to understand how all the instruments come together. So first, let's talk about remaining percussion instruments, I think, I'm going to come next. So the a remaining percussion instrument that we haven't talked about is a xylophone type instrument called a gumban. Now, xylophone instrument refers to the fact that um, the bars are made of wood. And it actually has quite a wide range, um, or one of the widest ranges of any of the instruments in a Japanese gamelan ensemble. A gumbang tends to play um, elaborating, so fast moving parts. Um, we might not be using it in a gamelan ensemble this semester, um, but if we did use it, um, we, would, we would tend to play the, the melody on the gumbang in using both hands. Um, gumbang takes a lot of training and uh, it's a very difficult instrument to play. Um, and it produces a, although it's wood, it produces quite a soft sound. And it produces a soft sound because of the type of mallets that I use. So the head of the gumbang mallet is um, quite similar to the, to the mallets that are used for the gender. Um, they're slightly smaller, but they're on a much more flexible um, kind of long mallet. Okay, so the, the mallet actually it flexes much more than the gender mallet. So that was the kind of last percussion instrument that we're going to talk about in terms of Javanese gamelan. And we're now going to move on to talk about a, a stringed instrument in the Javanese gamelan. And this is the um, one of three instruments that we're going to talk about. And it's called a rebab. And a rebab is a spike fiddle instrument. And if you look at the rebab picture on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see it's in the stand at the moment and um, where it be kept during breaks and rehearsals. But at the bottom, you can see how it comes down into a spike. OK, so when the person is, the player is playing um, the rebab, the instrument stands from the ground on the spike. OK, and there is a metal string, okay, that runs from the, it's wound around the top of the instrument, it goes down the front of the instrument, around the spike, and then can travel back up the instrument and around the tuning pegs. So at the top of the instrument, you'll see two pegs that stick out like this. That's the tuning pegs, and the metal string runs around one tuning peg, down to the bottom, around the base, and back up to the tuning peg. So in effect, there are, although there's one metal string, it looks like there are two strings that are being played. And then the bow is played across the two strings. So the rebab is quite important um, because it's termed as the leader of the melody in a Japanese gamelan ensemble. Although it might not play the same part as the sarong, or the slintum, and we tend to think that those instruments play the melody. The rebab is a very important melodic instrument in anticipating particular melodic notes, and it also interacts um, with the singers or the vocal parts in an ensemble. Moving on to other types of string instruments, uh, quite a common instrument is the zither, um, or zither in English. And it's a small kind of box-like instrument that has lots of strings across the top of it. And often it's played um, with resting the zitter on the box, the case that it's carried in. And you can see um, the case of the zitter in this example on the left-hand side of the screen. 
and the zitter would be placed in front of the performer and they would have long thumbnails and sometimes long fingernails and they would pick out the strings like this okay with their thumbs and they might damp some of the strings with their other remaining fingers and um, they pick out certain patterns of strings that link to important melody notes we'll talk about important melody notes in the lectorial that will follow this video. So that's the zitter. The zitter produces a very high um, sound, quite a stringent sound. Um, some people hate the sound of the zither when they first um, listen to it uh, because it can be, it's very to the front of the gamelan ensemble because it's a high pitch. Um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to tune the rest of the ensemble. Another more um, common type instrument um, it's called the chalampong, and it produces a much more mellow sound, um, and it has its own special sound, as you can see from the screen. Uh, it has, um, because it's slightly larger than the zitter, it produces a mellow sound, and um, but it's not as common as a zitter in a in gamelan ensemble. So those are the string instruments that would be used in a gamelan ensemble. But we also have a, a, a wind instrument um, called a suling um, that might be performed. And this is a, a kind of duct flute. And it's called a duct flute um, because of the, the notch, the air notch, as you can see on the slide here. And a suling that notch is a bit like what you would find on a school recorder, for example. I don't know if you played the recorder at school, um, but the, where the air comes out at the top of the instrument, that's kind of a duct. But the, the difference is that the recorder has a specific mouthpiece that you play down, um, so it's not necessarily exactly like a recorder. You can have several different types of suling that have, um, you can have high, middle and low suling sometimes. Um, but the suling tends to play quite a free part and tends to elaborate around the melody. So that's the only wind instrument in a Japanese gamelan ensemble. And then finally, um, we have vocal parts. If vocal parts are present in a gamelan ensemble, there tends to be a male chorus, so a collection of men who sit and sing a specific part. And often this part tends to be quite set in relation to the melody. The group of men who collectively sing this part are known as the Geron or the Geron. But we also might have a female solo vocalist uh, who would perform. And uh, a female solo vocalist is called a Pissenden. In the picture on the screen, we can see a collection of uh, Pissenden or Sinden, which should be the plural verb. Um, but they would take it in turns to sing. Uh, it is it's uncommon for a group of women to perform, whereas a group of men will perform in the karong. So those are the remaining instruments, melody instruments, um, elaborating instruments, um, string instruments, wind instruments, voices. Okay, within a Japanese gamelan ensemble. And I've gone through all the instruments that are depicted on Margaret Kartomi's slide um, from her 1980 reading about the instruments in a typical central Japanese gamelan ensemble. But we can also categorize these instruments in various ways. So um, Andy Sutton talks about uh, loud instruments and soft instruments within a Japanese gamelan ensemble. And Loud instruments refers typically to uh, colatomic structure instruments such as suspended gongs and cradle gongs, uh, the small chime gongs of the bonan, uh, the instruments that would play the melody in the vertical commas, the saron and the blentum, uh, and the different types of drums, kendang and biduk. Soft playing instruments have a less direct sound, um, such as the gender instruments, the gambang, suling chalampong, the string instruments other string instruments, the zitter, the rabab, and then the vocal, the vocal parts. 
Loud playing instruments traditionally would be played out vines because they're loud and the sound would carry, particularly to welcome the king as he processed through his palace, for example. Softer instruments would be played inside and um, would be kind of reserved for music accompanying various events that would be inside the palace. So that's the loud and soft differentiation. But we can also differentiate or categorize, classify gamelan music according to um, an ethnomusicological uh, system. And this is quite a straightforward system that's used by ethnomusicologists to classify instruments all around the world. And it's called the horn bostel sax system. It's based on two very famous academics at the beginning of the 20th century. Hornbostel refers to a, a guy called Erich von Hornbostel, and he was a psychologist, whereas Abram Sachs was an art historian. Both Hornbostel and Sachs worked in an institute in Berlin uh, at the turn of the 20th century, and this institute was called the Berlin Phonogram Archive. And this archive housed phonogram recordings, so um, wax cylinder recordings um, of various musics and sounds from around the world. And these cylinder recordings were made on a phonograph that was invented by Thomas Edison in 1877. He was an American inventor. And the phonograph allowed, it sound, allowed sound to be recorded for the first time. So the, phone, the Berlin Phonogram Archive collected all these wax cylinder recordings and the collection is still today, I mean the collection still exists, uh, it's still the largest collection of wax recordings in the world, it's, it's enormous. But Hornbostel and Sachs found that when they were listening to sounds that had been recorded around the world by explorers, missionaries, anthropologists, um, and that were taken back to Berlin, the customary classification of woodwind, brass, strings and percussion as is applied to Western classical instruments really didn't uh, accommodate all the different instruments that they were transcribing from the, uh, the cylinders that they were listening to. So they decided to come up with their own system. And there are four classifications, there are four areas four categories within this classification system. And these are aerophone, chordophone, idiophone, and membranophone. So aerophone, if you think of the word aeroplane, um, refers to instruments that are produced um, by, by vibrating air. So it's instruments that are blown. Um, uh, and that's kind of a good way to remember it. Chordophone, chord, string, um, refers to instruments, that, string instruments, or uh, instruments that are produced with a vibrating string. Idiophone um, refers to instruments where the body of the instrument produces the sound itself. So it often refers to percussion instruments, whereas membranophone refers to instruments that produce the sound from a vibrating skin. And this generally denotes various drums. So aerophone, chordophone, idiophone, and membranophone can be used to categorize um, the instruments in the Javanese gamelan ensemble. So coming back to some important terms that we have that you will see in the readings and that we've been discussing in class, we've already discussed in the lectorial in week one the term karawitan. And uh, Karawitan uses the root, root verb rawit um, from the Indian language Sanskrit, and it means refinement or intricate. And Karawitan is a term that is applied to gamelan practices or uh, practices that are associated with gamelan music, such as dance, theatre, and puppetry. Uh, so it's a kind of gloss term for classical Japanese gamelan music. But there are also other terms that are important or connected to Karawitan. And these terms are important when we're talking about elaboration or tuning uh, within a Japanese gamelan ensemble. So the first term um, on this slide is lagu. 
which means melody or song. And this term can apply to instrumental and vocal performance to do with gamelan music. And lagu um, it has several constraints on a term. So a lagu is constructed in a particular way depending on other aspects of the music. And lagu can be defined according to laras, which is the tuning system that's used for a particular composition. And in a Javanese gamelan ensemble, there tend, or a full Javanese gamelan ensemble, there tends to be instruments in two tuning systems. Slendro, which is a five note tuning system, and the intervals between each of these five notes can be, or tends to be more or less the same, but they're not exact, the intervals between the, the, the notes. And Pelog, which is a seven note tuning system that has small and wide intervals. Pelog tends to sound a bit minorish, whereas Lendro tends to sound a bit more majorish if you compare it to Western temper tuning. Also, if you think about Slendro, it's got seven letters, but has five notes. Pelog has five letters, but has, denotes a tuning system with seven notes in it. Patet is a term that is linked to tuning. And so you can have either a Slendro or a Pelog, Lara. And then within Slendro or Pelog, you have different Patet, which are different modes. So if we take Slendro, for example, Slendro has six notes, but depending upon um, the Patet, the music is categorized in a different way. So in Slendro, there are three Patet. Each Patet begins on a different note and includes a different sequence of notes within the, the, within the mode. So, although there are six notes in Slendro, the patet for Slendro do not necessarily use all six notes in them. So they might use five of the notes. So they'll omit one, but they'll start on a different note. Okay. It's not really important that you go into or know about patet in great detail. It's a very complicated issue. It's an issue that has obsessed um, ethnomusicologists uh, since the 1940s. Um, but uh, there are many, many books written on patet. So if you want to um, go and investigate patet and learn all about this very complicated aspect of Japanese theory, um, you can go and knock yourself out. Um, there's a book um, called uh, The Nuclear Determinant of Patet by Mantle Hood, um, but it's a very big read. What is important in terms of patet are cellar notes. And cellar notes are notes that are also called goal tones. And these are notes that the music goes towards. Okay? And in terms of cellar notes, if we think of the pieces that we've been playing in the Japanese gamelan workshop, at the end of each line on the notation, um, that's a cellar note. Okay? Um, that the music works towards these notes. And these notes also determine the pitches of the kanongs and the kampu, um, and they also determine the various flowering patterns that are played on uh, the bonan, for example. And we'll learn more about flowering patterns over the next couple of weeks. Bentuk and Gending are two other words that you might encounter in readings about Japanese gamelan music. Bentuk um, refers to form, and ginding is a gloss term for structure. Ginding can also be another word for composition. Irama refers to tempo uh, relationships and can be glossed as tempo. And we discussed Irama as a set of tempo relationships or, tem or tempo density um, in the week two lectorial. Kapatahan refers to the gamelan notation system that's used um, to notate gamelan music in terms of numbers, uh, rests, and various symbols for um, the gong structures that are used. Here's an example of Kapataham that we looked at in the week two lectorial, and we also listened to um, this recording. So 
you can see in this recording that there are dots and numbers in a line. So that depicts the, the melody in inverted commas. The, the numbers depict the pitches of the sirens that are played. And then above the melody notes, you have the various um, symbols for the different gongs that articulate the colotonic structure. And this gets us to the point of um, this video, which is the term for melody um, in Javanese gamelan is um, the word balungan. And um, balungan is actually quite a complicated structure, a complicated idea. Um, and actually the whole notion of melody, or what we might consider as being melody, uh, is quite, a, it's quite an abstract thing in Javanese gamelan. So balungan literally means bone or skeleton in Javanese. Uh, so in this sense, the balungam provides the, the nuclear melody. So if we go back uh, to look at the kapataham, the, the numbers um, that we can see, particularly in the first line of the notation, 1615, 1615, um, that's the and we tend to think of it as the melody. However, gamelan musicians together create the melody in relation to one another. And this is a, an idea that we're going to discuss um, more. So individual instruments and vocal parts together, together react or relate together, that's what I'm wanting to say, uh, in order to create the baloma. But in terms of talking about the lung and in class and in relation to the reading examples, if you think of the saron instruments and the slantum instruments as playing the balongan, that will help uh, to uh, clarify uh, the discussion. Okay, so we'll talk about conceptualizing melody um, and how instruments interact together uh, to do that in the lectorial that will follow. So, what have we done in this lecture? Well, we've introduced the concept of melody by talking about the instruments that play the melody in a Javanese gamelan ensemble. And we've also talked about the remaining instruments that play elaborating parts. And we'll learn in the lectorial how the elaborating instruments, how they need the melody in order to figure out their parts. Um, and we've also discussed important terms associated with Javanese gamelan music. And these are important terms that are associated with Karawitan or classical gamelan performance. So we'll be talking more about these terms in um, the following lectorial. Um, so please try and remember as much as you can about the instruments and the sounds that they produce and also the terms that we've discussed.